Welcome to Nine Bob Note with Paul Isles Rush and Ken Moss. Hello and welcome to Nine Bob Note. I am Paul. And I am Ken. Hello, Ken. Bonjour, Le Paul. What have we got in store for this instalment? Three wishes for 2024. Ooh. We're already a few weeks into 2024. <laughs> we are. So some of these might be retrospective. They might be things that have already happened. And we think, mm, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> the power of pod compels you. <laughs> well, would you like to light the way with your first wish for the year? My first wish of the year is... An end to wokery. Now, I am not the best person to project wokery onto. Straight white middle-aged man, I am the antithesis of everything that the world (laughs) likes these days. I do get the whole idea of pushing forward diversity inclusion. It's great, and it is the way forward. It's been the way forward for a very long time. And strangely, the first thing that leapt to mind when I said those words was Star Trek. In the 1960s, it was really pushing forward, but it didn't, it was just there. It was just, you've got this crew, all different nationalities, races, all coming together, all working together, and it's never mentioned. And it just worked. It was brilliant. Now, unfortunately, you've got all different races, nationalities, sexualities, and it's all that they mention. People on TV that have got a personality trait or a minority trait, that is all they mention. Can we please move on from this? If we're going to have a diverse cast in things, no problem. But shut the hell up about what makes you different if you want to be treated the same. To me, it really takes away from characters when all they do is bang on about their particular characteristic as if that's the only personality trait they've got. I'm black, I'm trans, I'm, well, less so these days, but I'm gay. Oh, God, isn't life hard? Right, well, is there anything else that you're interested in at all? Do you you have a job? Do you have hobbies? What are your interests? Well, I'm black, that's enough, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, move on. Yeah, I get where you're coming from. As you say, the world, and particularly we're talking about the portrayal of the world in the media. That that is a fair aspect, yes. Is a lot more diverse than some people would have you believe it. But yes, there is a place for dramas about racism, for example. Yes, there's a place for coming out dramas. Uh, Yes, there's a place for comedies about, you know, gay people at (laughs) university. I don't know. And that's absolutely fine. And yes, a lot of these minority groups have been through struggles and it's very important that those are recognised and portrayed and that we don't forget about them. We don't brush them under the carpet. But as you have said, when we're talking about stuff like that, put it in Coronation Street. And that's fine because that would be one story as part of all, you know, all the others. Mm. And that's great. Do a six part drama about, you know, Russell T. Davis drama, you know, like mm. queer as folk or something, you, you know. That's absolutely fine. But when we're talking about, let's say, Doctor Who, (laughs) great. Doctor Who's always been inclusive. It's always been diverse. But yes, let's not have the diversity be what the show is all about. So, for example, Rose, the trans character, great. Got a nice trans character in there. Brilliant for representation. Hurrah. But have them do something. <laughs> like have them All she moaned about the whole every line was about how trans she is. Yeah. And, and I can't invest in a character that just moans all the time or they're always on duty for their particular cause. Mm. And uh, that, that translates to real life as well, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. But I mean, in that Doctor Who episode with Rose. The fact that she was trans was the entire reason for the character. And that kind of grates, doesn't it? You know, in that particular instance, it really did yeah. because it was a massive crowbar. It wasn't even an organ. I mean, the, the fact that Donna Noble had a trans daughter, it could have been quite interesting, actually. Yeah. It, it could have been quite good. But A, the fucking thing never shut up about how trans she was. <laughs> 
and how male presenting and she was dead named at one point again for yeah for dudes, that's a, a serious thing but every time she opened her mouth it was about being trans it's just one example but it's not the only mm, example yeah i am a big advocate that if you want things to be normalized don't mention them just have them there it doesn't need to be signposted we get the message take for example and we've banged this drum before heart stopper mm. i don't remember any of those characters the odd line here and there about that's homophobic you can't say that the odd line mm. it was a very diverse cast none of them ever mentioned it they were just all characters in their own right it was brilliant yeah even the character played by Yasmin Finney, who was trans, and part of the whole story was her friendship group coming to terms with the fact that she was trans and she was at a different school and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think they used the word trans they didn't. at all in the whole thing. Well, not that I know of, uh, but it, it was so subtly done mm. that it was left to the viewer to work it out. Yeah, I loved that. Mm. I just think it was a clever bit of writing. It was a clever bit of TV. It was far better than, I'm trans. If you don't like it, get over it. <laughs> and you don't know how hard it is being black. <sighs> no, I don't. And neither do you in the UK. It's just, I just don't think that there's this great wall of, of hatred towards uh, minority groups that is portrayed. I'm sure there are incidents, don't get mm. me wrong. But I just don't think that society is as anti-everybody as it likes to paint itself out. If you've got any sort of minority trait now, it's displayed writ large in the media and in public that it's a really hard time just being me. Mm. I don't think it is. No, and it does sort of amplify for people who are going through that. So using the example of being gay, if all you see on TV or on the radio or in films or in books is, oh my God, this character came out as gay and they were rejected or they got beaten up or they hid it from their family for years and years and it ate away at them. Then that's going to make you feel that, well, I, I don't think I can tell anyone because that could happen to me. Whereas if you see portrayals of gay people as normal people, then you might think, well, I'll just tell my family. And they probably won't be bothered because most people aren't bothered. So, yeah. In 2024, most people aren't bothered yeah. by anything. No. I mean, they might have private thoughts, but I just do not believe that in modern society, certainly in the UK, I can't speak for around the world. Well, mm. there's certain places around the world that are just hateful still. <laughs> but in the UK, certainly, there isn't this great, hateful, bigoted, racist society that is portrayed. If you want real hardship... Go to somewhere like Qatar or Saudi Arabia. Please. Yeah, and then come back. I do love the idea that all these myths that are peddled about somewhere like Dubai. I went to Dubai a few years ago, and really, it, it's not this backward savagery that everyone portrays it to be. You'll get your hands cut off if you're gay or a woman shows a bit of leg or something. It's really not. And that city's for you. They're all, mm. they're all the same. Uh, so I think portrayal has a lot to, or, or uh, preconceptions yes. have a lot to do with perpetuating myths. But personally speaking, if you're gay or black or disabled or any of the above, you're actually, you've got an open door to a lot of places that maybe 10, 15 years ago you didn't. And now you're actually, you will be well looked after and well cared for probably more than I would be. And I don't have a chip on my shoulder about it. Great. It's a, it's evolution of society. I mean, it's great. But, but please don't portray the world to be far worse than it is. We don't need to make things up. The world's bad enough as it is without inventing any more problems. Yeah. Just not to labor the point, but there was a TV series last year, an American TV series, The Last of Us, based on a video game. And it's basically set in a, I think it's a zombie apocalypse. Of course it of is, Because yeah. that's yeah. all there are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there was one particular episode of it, and it sort of took away from the main story. So the main story is about a, a man and a, a young, or a sort of teenager, sort of trying to get from one place to another without dying. But there was this one episode, and it featured two men, in the 50s mm -hmm. and it was just it was a story about how they were sort of thrown together by this apocalypse it was a love story it was it was them how they built this life together and it was a really really lovely hour of tv and it's got critical acclaim 
even if you don't watch the series, it's a really good standalone hour of TV. Right. But it was because, they, yes, it was two men. Um, and there was a little bit, you know, about the, the struggle of one of them sort of to accept that he was actually gay at that stage of his life. But the main thing was, was these two people who found themselves in this situation and made a relationship in the middle of the apocalypse. And that was it. It was a normal, well, as normal as a zombie apocalypse can be. <laughs> That's but, how all gay people get together. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it was just... It was so nice. There was no big sort of coming out to each other because there was only the two of them in the whole episode. If it had been an episode about a man and a woman or two women or a zombie and a man, you know. <laughs> Sounds like an episode of Jeremy Kyle, I fell <laughs> yeah. in love with the zombie. <laughs> but yeah, if it had been any of those other combinations, it still would have worked and it still would have been just as effective. And they didn't make a big deal out of the fact that it was two men. That's how it should be. Just have relationships in stuff like that. If it's part of the story, so if it's a gay drama or a, a drama about a trans person and their struggles, then obviously, yes, focus on that. If it's a story about anything else, if it's a story about zombies, then yeah, put some gay people in, put some trans people in, but just let them be and let actual them have, human beings, yeah, actual and let them characters. Have personalities and interests and you know, things that you don't like about them. So, yes. You can't say that. That's transphobic. <laughs> I think that the only exception to that in real life is uh, vegans. Vegans <laughs> really do never shut up about being vegan. That is true. <laughs> I've rattled on a bit about this. That was my first wish for 2024. What's yours? <laughs> yeah. My first wish for 2024 is one that probably won't surprise you <laughs> too much. Our beloved Doctor Who <laughs> really hits the ground running. We've got a full series, well, an eight episode series <laughs> coming up later this year and a Christmas special. Russell T. Davies is back at the helm. I think it's going to be really good. We have had some questions <laughs> over the recent episodes about how far is he going to go, particularly with regard to your last, <laughs> your last yeah. point. Yeah. But... From what we saw in the the Christmas special, I really thought it's going to be a very different style of show, which I think is going to worry or upset some people. And it is going to maybe take a bit of time to get used to. But I just thought there was such a an energy to it and such a, I don't know, big buzz around it. And also the seeds were planted for so many storylines. Russell T. Davies never does anything that isn't for a reason. So as an example of that is we were watching it and I watched it with Stuart, my husband, who not a big Doctor Who fan, but he was stuck in with me on Christmas Day, so he had to watch it. And Anita Dobson was in, in yes, it for about two was... seconds at the beginning and then and then she was in it for about two seconds in the middle. And then just as it was about to finish, Stuart was like, what was the point in Anita Dobson? As she turns to camera. Yeah, yeah, as she broke the fourth wall. And there's obviously more to come from that, you know, just those kind of mysteries. Those are the things that have been missing from Doctor Who for years. Just those little, you know, those little seeds that might go somewhere, might not go somewhere. The one that I always remember is, it must have been the series with the Doctor and Donna, so mm. however many years ago. And there was just the occasional mention of... The bees, bees disappearing. Yeah. And nobody really thought about it. You know, it was just like a, the odd, oh, you don't see bees much these days, do you? And didn't mean anything. You didn't even notice it until it actually came in and it was a, a, like a major storyline at the end. So those kind of things I'm really looking forward to, to seeing. I'm very excited. Well, that. if we get to see more of Anita Dobson, I'm very happy. Hurrah. My main concern with this I will say it outright, I loved the David Tennant specials. Mm. He is just Doctor Who. He lives and breathes Doctor yes. Who. And it reinforces and underlines my case for an older actor to play Doctor Who. I think he's better as 14 than he was as 10. Yes. That's my concern with Shooty Gat. Well, I've got to be honest, I'm not sold. The accent racist. Does get, I am. <laughs> I am a racist bigger than that because he's queer as well. He's come out as queer. Homophobe. Yep. Anything else we can take in there? Probably. He's, he's got a bad leg. You're ableist as well. 
<laughs> he hasn't got a bad leg. I don't think he's got. No, he's got a, a disabled accent. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> Doesn't work very well. <laughs> Scottish and Rwandan, isn't it? And English and With a bit of Caribbean. Throughout yeah, that as well, and right? Ting. I hated and Ting. Hated it. It's playing up to being black <coughs> rather than just being an actor in your own right now. Leave that. So all of that you can put aside. I'm not convinced. I wish he'd got the part when he was about 10, 15 years older. I think he would have had a better weight. We've only seen one and a bit episodes with him, so it might be massively unfair. I hope I'm very wrong. Mm. But the whole feel of the show is more Doctor Who than it certainly has been for the past five years. Yeah. So, yeah, good times ahead, I hope. Hooray. My second wish for 2024 is... that people stop suing the arse off each other. (laughs) We've slept walked into a very litigious world, and I'm going to pin this at America's door. Mm-hmm. Now, as a big part of my work, I am exposed on a daily basis to legal scenarios. Yes. And I see a lot of people making allegations that aren't necessarily true. But those allegations have a knock-on effect to the people that are being alleged against. <laughs> <laughs> you alligator. <laughs> that's and the legal term. That's the legal term. It definitely is. And... It's unfair because, thankfully, most of the time that these clearly false allegations are made, they are swept out, and that's the end of that. But I hate to use the old expression, shit sticks. Mm. And there's no smoke without fire and other such vulgar appellations that basically in 2024, it only takes the vaguest whisper of a rumour and you are tried, hung, drawn, quartered, burned, and then fed to the docks. And it's not fair. But the one thing I will say is that I see a lot of people bringing false allegations and it comes back very heavily on them Mm. when they lose and the legal costs are exceptionally bad. (laughs) So it's both a tiny thing and a major thing, but I just think it's massively unfair when false allegations are made. And I've got to say, nine times out of ten, it's against men. Mm. Their lives, their reputations, whether they're found innocent or not, the damage is done and there's no comeback on the person who's made the allegations. Yeah, and if you're talking about particularly criminal allegations, the person who is accused of doing it is very often widely known or it's easy to get hold of their name, Mm. whereas the the victim is protected and not named unless they choose to to waive uh, anonymity. And so by the time that it's proven that this didn't happen or, you know, it's thrown out or the person says, oh, yeah, sorry, I made it up, that alleged perpetrator is already out there and is already known as the rapist Mm. or, you know, or whatever it is. And yeah, it is. It's an awful thing. But also it makes it so much harder for the people who are actual victims of crimes like this to come forward because people are developing a tendency to just not believe it. Say, well, look what happened Mm. with... And you're Cliff Richard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just like Cliff Richard. So, uh, but yeah, it doesn't help anyone. And a lot of the time, as you say, it's a way of trying to get money or to get, you know, some kind of recognition or some, some kind of compensation. And surely no one's life is worth wrecking for something like that. So, yeah. Well, I do see it coming back more and more on these people that are making allegations. Mm. And they do end up with colossal legal bills for something that they thought, ah, oh, well, I can pull a fast one against the council because I tripped over a paving slab or something. <laughs> and now I'm suing for £20,000 and a life wrecked. And I think the last one I saw, they got 750 quid, <laughs> And the legal fees are 40000 <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, (laughs) yeah. Uh, But also, these sort of things against councils and what have you, people sue for ludicrous amounts over the tiniest things. They might sue for £5,000 or something because they sat on a park bench that had a splinter in it. But the legal fees for the council, the tens of thousands of pounds, Mm. even if they win, they've still got those costs. This is coming out of the public purse. Yes. So next time one of your mates says, oh, yeah, I got £10,000 for the council because, you know, I drove over a bollard in Preston Town Square. (laughs) I don't know why it wasn't lit up. Mm -hmm. Those people, A, shouldn't be on the road. (laughs) But B, you have just taken twenty or £30,000 out of the public purse. Yes. That could have been spent on something else. It could have been, that's enough to pay for three or four pieces of equipment at a play park. Yeah, idiots. So, yes. Your second way of making the world a better place? My second wish for 
this year is going to be... Certain elements of young people need reining in. I don't want to sound like a grumpy old man. Oh, please do. You're in good company. (laughs) But the example I'm going to use is the village where I live at the moment. There is a group of teenagers, even if they are teenagers, they're not very old teenagers, who act like they're in a gang. Mm. Now, you know, this isn't the east end of London <laughs> you know we're not we're not home to the Cray twins or anything like that there's no criminal enterprise going on they just cause a nuisance but particularly for older people and more vulnerable people it's intimidating and they don't want to go out into the village because they might meet this group of people they'll walk mob handed into the spa mm. and you know like knock stuff over or shoplift stuff there's a an off license over the bridge where every day you go past there's a, the windows boarded up because it's been smashed in again and it's very bad because immediately you think oh, kids and it's then really hard for the majority of kids who are actually growing up to be quite decent people who just have this sort of black mark against them right from the start because they're they're part of the youth so where I work yesterday we had a, a work experience event and it was a bunch of 16 year old kids who came in and the idea was that they were from schools in disadvantaged areas I mean, it was Manchester, so they had quite a, quite a wide pool. To... <laughs> but they came in and they were lo- learning about different ways that they could use the law in a career. So they had people from, you know, from where I work. There was the, the government legal department. There was people coming in from like the police and solicitors companies and stuff. But when I walked into the room to do our bit, it was after lunch And there was 20 of these kids and they were all dressed in grey tracksuits, airpods in, slouched in their chairs, probably on their phones. A couple of them had scarves around their their faces. And the girl who I was doing the presentation, you know, did the session with, we sort of looked at each other and thought, this is going to be hard work. And we had judged them based on the fact that they were teenagers. Mm. Um, I mean, they looked like, you know, your stereotypical teenager. But as soon as we got started, they were the most engaged. They were really clever, really intelligent. They wanted to learn. They had to put on a presentation at the end of the thing and they were sort of, they were fighting each other. Well, not physically fighting, but, (laughs) you know, I want to do it, I want to do it. And they took it in turns and they stood up and they made these really powerful legal arguments based on about 20 minutes of reading that they'd done. And they really surprised us. And it's such a shame because we decided that they weren't going to do any good based on our experiences with just a handful of teenagers where it really should be the other way around. So basically my wish is that these horrible ones would disappear and then we can focus on the ones who are nice, which is almost all of them. Well said, sir. <laughs> I don't know whether I, I don't know what bracket I fall into now because I hate everybody. <laughs> you might have heard me go on about old people. Yes. The older I get, the more I'm hating old people. <laughs> Honestly, they're, they're just so thoughtless. Yes. They really are. And a lot of the teenagers I've met, like you've just said, they don't do themselves any favours by the way they conduct themselves and it does tarnish the rest. Mm. And it is difficult when they're just completely and utterly obsessed with TikTok <laughs> and just AirPods in all the time. I'm trying to compare it with myself at that age. I suppose it's comparable in that I spend a lot of time at that age. I like nothing better than just to absorb myself for hours and hours playing video games. But I did have other interests as well. You know, I did get out there when I was sort of 17, 18. I had three or four jobs going. So there were plenty coming in. And then I went out at the weekend. They don't really tend to do any of that anymore. There's lots of restrictions on what jobs they're supposedly allowed to do anymore. So they can't have paper rounds. They can't work in kitchens because it's slave labor or something. And But they don't go out at weekends. They don't socialize. They don't go down to the pub and have a drink after work. It's really odd that I would mm. not be a teenager growing up. No. The same old things crop up that came up when we were teenagers. That, oh, well, if the council put on more for them, then they wouldn't be. Bollocks. No. That's never been true. If there was a community centre when we were growing up, we wouldn't have gone to it either. No, never. So 
It is all down to personal engagement. I do lay a lot of it at the parents, but not all of it. It can't all be squarely laid at the parents. I've known many kids that have been brought up in perfectly good environments with good values. They've still gone off the rails. Uh, But yes, I I agree. Don't tar everyone the same brush, but it's very easily done. Yes. Uh, Well, my third and final wish, it's quite a personal one. To get completely and utterly out of debt. Now, I'm not in debt beyond a couple of years left on the mortgage, but it's really started to hang over me. Things like, I, I mean, I took out a very small loan for a car earlier last year. There's also a bizarre tax error, which has left me about £25,000 in debt (laughs) because they put through my turnover as my profit. I wish it was. (laughs) I I wouldn't have a mortgage anymore. So, But that's all in the process of being sorted out. God bless the tax office. (laughs) When they cock up, they really do. But I've just, I worked out what I'd have to put into everything per week in order to clear it by January 2025. Mm. It's a stretch, but I can completely clear everything I owe to anybody in the world by 2025 and start next year basically a free man Mm. with no headaches of any kind. That makes it sound like I've got massive credit cards and store bills everywhere. I don't. I really don't. In comparison, compared to a lot of people, I credit card bill of a few hundred pounds is nothing. But overall, cumulatively, just to get everything cleared and out of the way within the next 12 months, as I say, it'll be a bit of a stretch, but it'll just give a peace of mind. I think, because I feel very sorry for anybody that's trying to get on the property ladder now. Mm. When we first bought houses, I don't think I've ever been in a position where it was three times your mortgage, the cost of a house, but it, because it was getting a bit of a stretch. That's why I ended up in Richland. It was... <laughs> uh, It was expensive buying a house even 20 years ago. But now it's borderline impossible. Yeah. You know, it's nine times your salary, the cost of an average house. This is in the north of England, in a a suburban area, not a particularly affluent area. What the hell? Yeah, it's very, very difficult. I I do worry about where things are going to go in the future generations. But yeah, it would be nice, wouldn't it, to just think when I get my wages at the end of the month, they're all, yeah, obviously you'll still have bills. Bills are so, yeah, but, but I mean, like I say, it doesn't make it sound like I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I'm, I'm really not. I'm, I'm as comfortable now as I've ever been in my life. It's, it's lovely, but I just want to take full advantage of it and mm. really clear the decks and yeah. just build to my own future so that I'm, I'm set up for life. Excellent. And while I've got the chance, I'm going to bang the drum one more time for premium bonds. <laughs> premium bonds have done me very, very well over the year. So boys and girls, put 100 quid a month away into premium bonds. They will look after you for life because mine have. Excellent recommendation there, Ken. And a, and a lovely wish to finish uh, your section on. Well, what's your third and final wish? My third wish for 2024 is more jaunts to the pub. Oh, probably flies in the face of most of the things we talked about in our resolutions and most of the things we've talked about tonight. I know it's not a very uh, deep and meaningful one. It's certainly not going to change the world, but it is going to make the world a better place Mm. for us. So whether it's just out walking the dog with Stuart and we say, well, let's take a detour and pop in for a pint, or whether it's you phoning up and saying, I'm in the neighbourhood, shall we go for a couple? Or whether it's a full-on pub crawl sesh. It doesn't matter. I just really like going to the pub and going back to what we were saying a couple of episodes ago about having to plan things in a big group and where are you going to be at this time and are we going to eat and does the table need to be booked that's great in its place but just saying let's meet in this pub at this time and, and go see, out on the and see where it goes yeah i heartily agree because strangely me and you haven't done this for all the years that we've known each other, we haven't done it properly for about 20 years. <laughs> and it's only in the past couple of... In fact, I think the first time that it happened properly recently was Platinum Jubilee Day. Mm. And that was such a lovely day. <laughs> I mean, it has kick-started. We've done it several times since. We've, you know, periodically, once, a, once every few months, we'll yeah. have a, a day out on the source. 
I think if we did it all the time, it would get very boring very quickly. <laughs> but it's something to look forward to. Mm. And we're doing our bit for the local economy. Exactly, yes. And hell do we do our bit for the economy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's to make up for all those people who've tried to ruin it with dry January. Dry January and Stoptober. And <laughs> what was the other one that I... Oh, it, was, it was a real crowbar. Parched March or something <laughs> oh, like that. It was, yeah, it, it was really... It was a real stretch. Well, there we have. We've got some, we've got some wishes for the year, or at least for the next eleven months or so. <laughs> <laughs> so the world will be a much better place this time next year. I'm sure it will. But with podcasts like this, how can it not be? Exactly, exactly. That draws us to a close. We will be back very soon with more podcasty goodness, including in the not too distant future, your birthday, birthday honors. So you better get your thinking cap mm-hmm. on. <laughs> but yes, until then. Ta-ta. Goodbye. Nine Bob Node featured Paul Isles Rush and Ken Moss. Title music was by Mark Scheiman, and the program was produced by Maverick Productions. For more information, please visit maverickproductionsuk.blogspot.com or find us on social media.